the golden age of the English essay. Essay is derived from the French word essayer, which means to attempt and to try, which points to the tentative, impermanent nature of the genre. An essay is a short form of a literary composition based on a single subject matter and often gives the personal opinion of the author. It's a prose composition, usually from 2 to 20 pages, dealing with or taking off from a specific topic. It is usually informal in tone and exploratory and tentative in its conclusions. It does not aspire to be the last word on its subject, but instead to reflect the private musings of a particular individual. Famous English essayist Aldous Huxley once defined the essay as a literary device for saying almost everything about almost anything. So who invented it? Was it William Webb Ellis? Who's William Webb Ellis who invented the... Oh, what? No, what? Uh, uh, what? Hey, what? Oh, no, not this kind of essay. This is the essay in rugby. Same name, different thing. <laughs> So now, seriously, the true inventor of the essay is the French Montaigne. By his true name, Michel Ikem. Ikem? Where they still produce some world-famous wines. Michel de Montaigne, born in Bordeaux in France in 1533, who retreated from the world into a tower on the family estate to think and reflect, where, as some noted, he wrote about cannibals, for them, and about cruelty, against it. After nine years of voluntary isolation and self-reflective meditation, Montaigne published in 1580 an original volume called Essays. At a time when most written discourse was impersonal and formal, Montaigne had the courage to write in the first person, often autobiographically. An ironic voice turning his self inside out. In Of Practice, he narrated his near-death experience after being knocked down from his horse by another runaway horse. In Of Cripples, he wonders of his own disability. His dedication to philosophical meditation is made clear in his own words. Everyone rushes elsewhere and into the future because no one wants to face one's own inner self. There is no denying. Indeed, the essay was invented by the French. However, one important voice, one important contributor in the early development of the essay is Francis Bacon. Bacon introduced a very different type of essay, which is a, the antithesis of Montaigne's. His voice is more restrained, seldom personal, almost magisterial. He, too, seems to philosophically turn things on all their faces, sometimes seeing merit in disaster and recognizing danger in success. Like here, prosperity is not without many fears and estates, and adversity is not without comforts and hopes. His style, his formulations are often memorable. In an essay entitled Of Suspicion, he compares suspicions with bats. Suspicions amongst thoughts are like bats among birds. They fly best by twilight. So uncertainty, lack of information, feed suspicions. It took the essay 17 years to cross the channel from France to England. Published in 1597, Francis Bacon's essays have short, crisp, philosophical, sometimes surprising titles such as of truth, of death, of revenge, of simulation and dissimulation, of marriage and single life, of envy, of love, of great place, of superstition, of delays, of coming, of friendship, of riches, of prophecies, of ambition, of nature in man, of youth and age, of beauty, of deformity, of gardens, of suitors, of studies, of praise, of vain glory, of anger, of vicissitude of things. Bacon's name was made famous by New Atlantis, 
a utopian book that was published in 1626 after his death. It was written in Latin and it was quickly translated into French and English. It's the image of a perfect society, a secret island with perfect urbanism. You can see the perfect grid of the city, but its role was to rule the universe. Two generations later, Thomas Hobbes, born in 1588, continued some of the social and political ideas that existed in Bacon's New Atlantis. Thomas Hobbes is primarily an English philosopher. He is regarded as being the founder of political philosophy, that is, the theory that explains and justifies the need of government. His major work, a massive essay, is Leviathan, the matter, form and power of commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. To be mentioned that commonwealth would mean a, a republic or a, a nation, common good, res publica. It should be noted that this book was published in 1651, two years after Charles I lost his head and we were already during the civil war that was ripping England. And it's quite obvious why Thomas Hobbes wrote this book at this particular time, because he was worried about what would happen if the English nation were left without any form of government. So therefore he's trying to legitimize the need of human communities to be ruled by government. And he speaks of notions that seem to anticipate a later notion of social contract, which is also to be found in Milton. The idea that there is some kind of implicit agreement between a population and its ruler. But he's also viewing the ruler as an absolute sovereign, illuminated, enlightened ruler. Why this title? Leviathan is a name borrowed from the Bible. It's the whale-like sea creature in the book of Job. And why this? Maybe because of the size of it, because of its magnitude and its force, its power. Because the basic idea is that nations that have a good government will prosper. And without proper government, then the condition of man is a condition of war, of everyone against everyone. A society without government, in such condition, there is no place for industry. Because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, no use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as requires much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of men solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. English philosopher John Locke, one of the most influential figures of the Age of Reason and one of the people who laid the foundation of the Enlightenment, chose as a means of expression of one of his most important philosophical treatises, the essay. His book-length essay concerning human understanding, published 1689, attacks nativism, the idea that was prevalent at the time that people were born with innate ideas from the womb, from their birth, and insists that we are formed little by little through socializing, through education. He also distinguishes between primary qualities, those qualities in objects that can be objectively measured, and on the other hand, secondary qualities that are just sensations. And he is responsible for pushing science towards observing primary qualities first and foremost, so therefore an empirical position. He's the father of empiricism. He also formulated theories of personal identity. He spoke of intuition. And what is interesting, he managed to put all of these in the form of a philosophical essay, which is more organized than anything you have seen in the previous essayists. Locke's two treaties of government have earned him the name Father of Liberalism. Sir Thomas Brown was not a theologian or a philosopher, he was a physician, a practitioner of medicine. Uh, he attended Winchester, Oxford, and then he wrote a number of books, 
of which Religio Medici is the most memorable. The title would translate as Religion as Medicine or Religion as Cure and it speaks about the consolations that religion can bring to people who are in distress, who suffer, whose spiritual life has been damaged and that religion can cure. The curiously titled Hydriotaphia actually makes reference to the practice of urn burial and this essay was ignited by the recent discoveries of funeral mounds uh, containing urns with human remains that had been found by archaeologists in Norfolk and Thomas Brown is again returning to his favorite theme of uh, death and the way religious practice can bring consolation to those remaining. The Garden of Cyrus is another bizarre essay. Printed in 1658, it's centered on the figure of the so-called quincunx, which is a lozenge, a rhomboid, of five points, like this. And this is actually a treatise about number five. Number five in nature, in plants, in sea creatures, in petals, in crystals, in history, in biology, everywhere. Sir Isaac Walton loved fishing, angling. This was his passion, going to fish in the countryside, in the British countryside with his tools, talking to people, enjoying the peace of loneliness and isolation. And as a result of his passion, he wrote one long essay which would look a bit like a manual. It's called the complete angler, the complete fisherman. There is in Romanian literature an author who did something very similar, and that is Alexandru Dobescu with his Pseudokinegeticos, Pseudokinegeticos Fals Tratade Vunatoare, a false treatise of hunting. In uh, Walton's uh, essay, there is a group of people bearing uh, Latin names. One is called uh, Venator, obviously this means hunter, Another is um, Piscator, this is a fisherman, and there is Auceps, Auceps, which would mean a uh, falconer. Uh, you know about the sport of uh, falcon hunting. And these guys discuss on a trip, on, on a boat trip on the Thames, the various merits of each of their passions, each of their sports. And the winner, of course, is a fisherman, because this is the most peaceful of these uh, pastimes. In the slow-moving, meandering dialogue between the three, Piscator has the best of arguments. Saint Peter, Saint Andrew, Saint John and Saint James were fishers. Michel de Montaigne, George Herbert, John Donne were anglers. Piscator retells biblical parables, legends from the antiquity, he draws typologies of fish lovingly described, the salmon, the trout, the carp, the pike. He describes angling techniques, angling as an art. He quotes numerous song lyrics. He charts a whole river geography of England and Ireland. In 1653, when The Complete Angler was published, England was in ruins after the Civil War. An Anglican oppressed, Isaac Walton fled London to escape persecution and to find peace and tranquility in the South, in Hampshire. And he found these. He died at 90, and he's buried in Winchester Cathedral, where a tainted glass window immortalizes him as an angler. Study to be quiet. This is his epitaph. And we might add his words. Too many men spend all their time in getting and next in anxious care to keep it. But we, anglers, pity them perfectly and stand in no need to borrow their thoughts to think ourselves so happy. 
In his immensely successful The Anatomy of Melancholy of 1621, Robert Burton mimics the form of a medical treatise, a medical textbook, handbook. The disease he speaks of is melancholy, which was a very fashionable mood at the time. Men loved to pose as melancholic, so did ladies. It was the sexiest thing at the time. Um, however, Burton chooses to speak about it as if it were some form of mild mental illness. And then he treats it, apparently very seriously, by presenting first the nature, the causes and the symptoms of this disease. Then he discusses the possible cures to it. And then he speaks of two particular forms of melancholy, love melancholy and religious melancholy. This is a book that comes from a very educated man. And then the book fills up with anecdotes, maxims, quotes, paraphrases from an enormous number of authors. And of course, there is a lot of mild irony behind all of this. It should also be said that Robert Burton used for the explanations and justification of melancholy a very old uh, medieval um, explanation, and that is the theory of the four humors. Humors not like in comical, but like in bodily fluids. There was this belief that there are virtually four main uh, body fluids that influence one's uh, well-being and also determine one's temperament. And one was the bile, the blood, the phlegm and the black bile. And each of them determined one temperament. in the company of these very interesting antique images uh, representing the four temperaments. very curious belief of medieval times, but which continued well into the 19th century, was the practice of bloodletting. If there was an excess of blood, they thought that by simply making a cut and draining the blood would serve as a cure. This would seldom be a cure, it would lead to debilitating conditions and might even kill the patient. Soon, many authors of essays were to become contributors to the new invention, the English press, journalism. Primitive periodicals called Corantos, then newsletters, then newspapers, then magazines. The first were published once a week, then twice a week, then three times a week, four times a week, and eventually every day of the week. 1621, the earliest surviving Coranto. 1729, the oldest newspaper in the world that has been published continuously ever since. James Edison and Richard Steele, both distinguished essayists, are commonly regarded as the makers of the British quality press. Steele published the Tatler from a verb that means to chat, to gossip, to talk a lot. And he started that in 1709. It's a magazine that was published three times a week and whose aim was, as he says, to pull off the disguise of cunning, vanity and affection from the faces of people. In 1711, Edison started the publication of The Spectator, a more ambitious magazine published daily. Daniel Defoe, owner of a printing press, published the Review of the State, and he is credited to have invented the leading column, the editorial. In 1703, Defoe took position against the restrictions that he and his fellow Protestants were facing because of the government uh, restricting their liberty, their chances at education and business. This article, The Shortest Way with the Dissenters, 
maintained ironically that the government should better kill off all the dissenters. This earned him a sentence to the pillory. The pillory or the stocks is this device to humiliate people in public. The legend has it that when he was put at the pillory, Defoe was so beloved, Defoe was so admired by the people that instead of throwing rotten cabbages and eggs, people started throwing flowers and men threw in the air their heads in sign of respect. <laughs>